So, at the beginning of Mark's gospel, we have a straight line. Not a circle, but a straight path from point A to point B. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. How different that is from the arenas in America in the 1870s and 1880s. Back then, believe it or not, the best game in town was to go watch people walk in circles on a dirt track. Sometimes these people would walk in circles for six days straight. And the fans, I mean, the bleachers were just loaded with spectators. It was a sport called pedestrianism. Walking in circles day after day after day. According to a March 30th Washington Post article, sometimes these people, these races would last for 144 hours straight. And besides taking an occasional nap on the cot, they hardly took any breaks at all, pushing themselves to the edge of physical and mental collapse. And the fans, they absolutely loved it. They packed the bleachers. It was the best game in town. There were no radios or TVs or computers to distract people. Competitive pedestrians were our first real celebrity athletes here in the United States. They had their pictures on trading cards. They were even, some of them even had endorsement deals that were very lucrative, like one uh, Dan O'Leary, who he once won a race by walking 520 miles in six days and became the spokesman for Dittman's Salt. John Hughes was sponsored by the National Police Gazette, and so his jersey was emblazoned by their logo, not a Nike swoosh or a UA of any kind. And competitive pedestrians were paid really well as, as also. A guy named Charles Rowell won a race in New York, and he was paid a handsome eight dollars In today's dollars, that would be equal $425,000. But alas, by the end of the 1800s, pedestrianism was dead. Not because the fans got bored of watching people walking in circles, but because of race-fixing and doping. One famous athlete, one famous walker was caught chewing a substance that they said gave him an unsportsmanlike advantage. He was chewing coca leaves from which cocaine was made. But you got to remember, folks, Back then in the 1880s, Coca-Cola's formula had coca leaves in it and also the caffeine from a cola nut, thus Coca-Cola. Well, we may laugh at this uh, competitive walking, but we have to admit that oftentimes we walk in circles as well. We keep eating the same junk food and wonder how come weight is so hard to lose. We find ourselves in the same social circles and are dumbfounded that we never meet new people. We keep picking on family members in exactly the same way and are surprised by blow-ups and fights. We go to work and do our jobs in a minimalist way and then wonder why we never advance in our careers. We bring a bad attitude to worship and leave church uninspired. We're pedestrians, walking in circles. In fact, one of the dictionary definitions for pedestrian is ordinary, undistinctive. 
the time has come for us to break out of our endless loops and do something truly distinctive and extraordinary. Walk the straight path. Mark tells us at the beginning of the gospel that the gospel of Jesus Christ is introduced by John the Baptist. He's the one who fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. I am sending one ahead of you, the voice that, will, that calls in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Make his paths straight, says Isaiah. Take out the twists and turns and circles of life and stretch them out and create a new straight path from point A, says Mark, to point JC, Jesus Christ. John points the way to Jesus as he fulfills the Old Testament prophecy appearing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He challenges the people to break out of that destructive cycle of sinfulness by changing their minds and walking in a new direction. That's the meaning of, of the Greek word metanoia. Change your mind. Turn around, go in a new direction, follow the straight path toward Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, most people today, though, see when they hear the word repentance, think of just being sorry for their sins. John is calling for more than just being sorry for your sins. And he's not even asking us to confess our sins. He's asking for something much greater and much more challenging. He's talking about people changing their lives to act differently, to be different than the rest of the world around us. John's baptism of repentance may be better translated as a baptism to show that they had turned from their sins and turned toward God. Or a baptism to show that they were changing their hearts and lives. Or a baptism of life change. The people were hungry for life change. So they flocked to see John. They desperately wanted to break out of their self-destructive cycles and move in a new direction. So the people of the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to John, confessing their sins, receiving the baptism of forgiveness. How many of us... <laughs> are hungry for a life change? How many of us want to break out of those destructive cycles that we find ourselves in and go in a new direction? We know that we're stuck walking in circles. We know that we need to be set on the straight path. But that's far easier said than done. The pedestrian approach would be to continue walking in circles. But in the gospel, Mark urges us to take a bold, extraordinary step and go and meet the promised one. Mark promised to put us in touch with Jesus he said, there's one coming after him who's more powerful than I am. And this guy, he says, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. There's the power to break our cycles. There's the power to set us on the straight path to Jesus. So as we move another week deeper into the season of Lent, we've got, well, almost two candles lit. Um, Mark puts us on the path toward Jesus. Because there, Mark says, is the power, 
in the presence of our God. There in Jesus, there's the power to change our hearts and to change our minds so that we might have that life-changing experience. Although our lives often feel like we're walking in endless circles, the Holy Spirit can and will replace our pedestrianism with a walk in Jesus' direction. And along the path of change, we are never alone, never without support. Because Jesus steers us, And Jesus strengthens us. First, Jesus steers us. He is ahead of us on the road, leading like a shepherd in the right direction toward a life of love, joy, peace, and simplicity. You remember what Jesus said to the rich one ruler, don't you? When the rich one, young ruler asked, what should I do to be saved? Jesus says, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus was inviting the young man to a life of love, joy, peace, and simplicity. But he couldn't do it. He was shocked by what Jesus said and turned around and walked away sad. He had a cluttered closet, and thus also a cluttered spirit. The straight path is not an easy path. Fortunately, Jesus not only steers us, Jesus also strengthens us. He baptizes us, with the Holy Spirit, filling us with his presence and power. That's why we are to remember our baptisms daily. In that baptism, the sin that so easily weighs us down, that keeps us walking in circles, is taken away, and we are raised up, refreshed, and refilled in Christ. In Christ, we are given love, joy, and peace, as well as all the other spiritual gifts, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These gifts are what are the marks of a Christian life. They are the clearest sign that a person is moving along the straight path of Jesus. Here in this place, each week, we come with our heavy load of sin, the sin that entangles our walk of life. And each week, our gracious Lord removes our sin and uplifts us with his grace. Each week, he gives us strength to meet every day with hope and promise. These gifts are spoken to us in the absolution. They're sung about in songs and hymns. They're proclaimed in the sermon. They're received in the sacrament of Holy Communion. These gifts of God strengthen us so that we can be inspired to live day after day after day in the joy of the Lord as we journey on the straight path of Jesus. So this Advent, Mark invites us to get out of our endless loops and walk in a new direction from point A to point JC. And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith that we share with one another by speaking together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in the fullness of time, you sent your servant John to be a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the hearts of the people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Bless also the pastors that you have sent among your people in our generation, that they would also be servants who faithfully prepare your people for the coming of Christ by proclaiming your word for the saving and comforting of many souls. Lord, in your mercy, bless all the leaders of our congregation, Lord. Give them the wisdom to know and the, de- and the determination to do your will. Give them your vision for the community and the region as we seek to establish places of hope and mission. Especially we pray for passageways and for the community of Pratt so that together we can serve you in whatever way you deem best. Lord, in your mercy, God of grace and power, you sent Jesus to break the power of sin, death, and the devil. We ask you to intervene in the lives of those who remain enslaved to drugs, alcohol, gambling, internet pornography, or any other kind of destructive addiction. Set the prisoners free, Lord. Jesus' blood has the power for forgiveness and new life. Do not let the evil one destroy the lives of those for whom you died. Lord, in your mercy... Lord of the nations, have mercy on those places ravaged by the Ebola virus. Thank you for those people, medical doctors, nurses, aid workers, who are willing to put their own lives at risk to help the sick and suffering. Protect them, Father, as they do your will by caring for their neighbors. Prevent the further spread of this disease and allow it to be contained. Lord, in your mercy... Father, hear us as we pray for those who are sick, hospitalized, or grieving. Continue to be with Marvin and Bonnie. Be with Francis and Vicki as they recuperate. Watch over Bill Peterson. Be with Cindy Twillman's mother, Doris, as she is hospitalized. Comfort the families of the Mosses and the Ellises. Be their hope and their strength, O Lord. Let them know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commit all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we gather our tithes and offerings in worship for our Lord. Hopefully, you received one of our attendance cards on the way in that you can fill out. Again, if there's no change in address or that, you don't need to fill out the whole address part. Just put the date and sign your name. And right in below or on back, the names of those who are attending at communion. We worship our Lord with our tithes and offerings. We also have a ministry minute. Uh, Glenn has a ministry minute for us. Uh, why didn't you get you a handheld mic? Right, you have to speak it. loud. <clears throat> <laughs>